like Pastor Ken is. So no need for her to come. Um, now, you will see me taking notes for her. <laughs> what? <laughs> You're looking for a lightning bolt to strike me dead on the spot? It, it should. <laughs> no, actually, um, she is uh, working and also taking uh, Elias to tutoring, so she was unable to make it. And she <coughs> sends you her regards, and she will uh, probably want to talk to you tomorrow at church to uh, <laughs> see how it went. So uh, why don't we go ahead at this time and uh, invite my pastor, Pastor Ken Ortiz, to come up, if you would, give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Actually, uh, am I on? Am I, is it, can you hear this? Are we on? I guess it is on. Okay. Well, anyway, um, <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, uh, by the way, J.D., the, the uh, NASA makes a, a particular form of Depends that, that you can wear for weeks at a time, and that's what I've gone to. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether you, number one, number two, it's, 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 really, it's, it's really great. It's designed for space travel. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. So it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of the kind of the cycle of life. You start out in diapers, you end in diapers. I don't know. What's going to and uh, anyway, uh, it is a pleasure being with you, and I and I trust and pray that God will bless this time that we have. I'd like you to begin by turning with me to your Bibles to Hebrews chapter twelve. I know it's a strange place to begin talking about marriage relationships, but then again, not all that strange because it deals with probably one of the most central issues, and that is enduring. So uh, that's where I want to start. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, the writer begins uh, as follows. He says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's begin with prayer. Father, I ask that as we reflect upon not only these words, but this whole entire issue of marriage relationships, Lord, that you would uh, give us much grace. You would give us an expanded capacity to hear and to understand and comprehend. Because, Lord, we need insight. There is not a one of us here who, no matter how long they have been married or how new their relationship is, there are simply seasons and moments and, and sometimes an ongoing state of, or condition where we wonder why something that seems so simple in the beginning has become so difficult, so complex, and, and, and sometimes so very, very painful. So God, we pray that you would help us to rediscover what you intended for this relationship to be about and how we can get there. So bless this time that we're going to spend today covering these issues. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin by sharing a true story. It's uh, regards a guy by the name of Larry Walters. In 1982, uh, when the event that I'm going to describe took place, he was a truck driver in Los Angeles. But his story really starts much earlier than that. Growing up near uh, uh, the uh, uh, El Toro Marine Base as a young boy, he used to often see the fighter jets, the Marine fighter jets, flying off and taking off from there. And so as a young boy, he decided that when he became older, he was going to be a fighter pilot. Not an uncommon aspiration for young boys of that era. But uh, when he got old enough, at 17 years of age, he enlisted in the Air Force. And, of course, you know how that the, oftentimes the, uh, uh, the enlister is, you know, he's, he's helpful. He's promising you everything. But, to, you know, when you are actually in the service, you get what they give you. His problem was his eyesight was not good. And so, therefore, they said he would never qualify as a pilot. And so, as a consequence, they had other opportunities, which in his case ended up being a military policeman. 
He put in his six years of service, discharge, and never even got to ride on an airplane the entire time he was in the Air Force, which is kind of ironic in many ways. But he never lost that desire to one day be a pilot, or at least one day to fly. And so one uh, sunny afternoon, as he was doing what he used to do on his day off, sitting in his backyard in his uh, extremely luxurious series lawn chair, he, with a Miller light in one hand, he was looking up at the sky, watching these commercial jetliners taking off from Los Angeles International. And in a moment, a flash of inspiration struck him. And he immediately uh, put his beard down, grabbed his car keys, jumped into his Jeep Cherokee, and headed down to the Army Ur Surplus store. When he got there, he purchased 40 uh, weather balloons. These are those four foot wide, you know, four foot diameter balloons that you fill with helium and they, they hold about 3.3 cubic feet of, of helium and uh, they use them basically to get wind direction and sometimes they attach, you know, certain instrumentation to them on a cord as they travel with the weather. And he bought 40 of these. Uh, he bought, a, picked up several canisters of helium and some large netting and cord. He put all of these balloons inside of this large net and then he tied them all together by a cord and began inflating the balloons one by one. Before long they were beginning to rise up and tower over his backyard and to make sure that they didn't drift away he tied the end of it to his Sears lawn chair and then a cord from that to the bumper of his Jeep. Now once he had finished and he had, everything had risen up, he, he began to make further plans. The first thing he needed to do was make sure that he had a full six pack of Miller Lite with him. He also had a, uh, a, uh, some sandwiches that he made. He uh, came up with a rope that he would use kind of like as a safety harness, a seat belt to keep him in his lawn chair because his plan was as follows. He was going to release the cord from the bumper of his car and then lazily drift over his backyard 30, 40 feet up in the air and just sit there and drink his beer, eat his sandwiches, and, and, and just kind of be the marvel of the neighborhood. And, uh, and whenever he decided that he wanted to finally get down, he brought with him a BB pistol, and the idea was that one by one he would shoot out the balloons, and as the loft was decreased, he would just gently, slowly come back to Earth. A great plan. Now, Larry was suffering from, I think, an analytical problem. Uh, there was a lot that he didn't know. He didn't understand aeronomics. He, he didn't understand the basic physics of, of what he was doing. Uh, and his problem was a lot like what we do many times. He applied static analysis, not dynamic analysis. Now, static analysis is 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3, or 1 plus 1 equals 2. But we know that in most of life, it really never works out that way. Never is it 1 plus 1 equals whatever. It's usually 1 times A prime to the fifth plus C plus D divided by 6. And in other words, there's all sorts of extenuating factors in every decision we make that we're always saying, I didn't foresee that dynamic. If you really get good at getting it wrong, then you're ready to run for political office. And you can make all sorts of promises that have no way of ever being fulfilled. But the bottom line is, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we realize is just the way life generally works. And so it was with Larry. He, he uh, climbed into his lawn chair with his provisions, tightened the rope, took out his pocket knife, slit the rope that was holding him tethered to his Jeep Cherokee, and that's when things began to take on a new complexion. You see, the problem is Larry didn't stop at about 30 feet. He didn't stop at 100 feet. He didn't even stop at 1,000 feet. It was almost as if he had been shot out of a cannon. In fact, he, to, to this very day, he holds the world record, the world height record for a homemade cluster balloon of 16,000 feet. Now, Larry would have been lost to all time and eternity uh, because as he reached those heights, he began to be caught by the winds that slowly carried him not only across federal airspace uh, where, uh, over L.A., but over Los Angeles International, but eventually he began to drift out into the Pacific Ocean where we probably would have never known he had gone. You know, he probably, you know, some people would have said he was one, the only person worthy to be raptured or something like that, but he just simply would have disappeared from the face of the earth. Well, uh, fortunately, as he was passing through the federal airspace over Los Angeles International, he was spotted by two airliners, a TWA jet and a Delta jet, that were both ascending, and they passed by him and radioed back to the tower, uh, something along this line, tower, 
we've just uh, passed a man at 10,000 feet in a lawn chair. <laughs> and he's armed. And uh, so for the next 20 hours, uh, federal authorities using high, alti high altitude uh, helicopters slowly coaxed Larry back down to ground. Uh, it, was a, it was a major effort. You can imagine the expense. As he is slowly descending, his balloon became entangled in high power wires, outing, cutting out electricity for over 20,000 homes. And so that by the time he actually got back to terra firma, they were so excited to see him that several representatives of the Los Angeles Police Department, as well as the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, were on the ground waiting for him and to escort him immediately to a, a new location in handcuffs. <laughs> but as they were putting him in the back seat of the cruiser, there was a television reporter who stuck the microphone in Larry's face and asked him the question, of course, that everybody wanted answered. Larry, why did you do it? Uh, to which Larry responded, a guy can't just sit around doing nothing all the time. <laughs> that probably said more about Larry than just about anything you're going to say because you realize he hadn't really given it a lot of thought. Uh, the story actually ultimately takes a very tragic end because Larry, who really like most of us had never done anything of, of, of celebrity status before, thought this was his opportunity to leave his mark on humanity and so he basically um, he hired an agent, he, he uh, wrote a book, hired an editor to help him write this book. Uh, the book didn't sell, his agent, agent couldn't book him into He wanted to be a motivational speaker, but you know, most people figured that sheer stupidity is hardly something you want to motivate people with. <laughs> and so you know, nobody would, would retain his services. Uh, he actually wrote a song, recorded it. The radio stations were not interested in playing it. Every avenue he went just simply didn't work out so that finally, after five years of frustration, Larry walked out into Los Angeles uh, uh, forest and uh, put a gun to his head and terminated his life. It's a very tragic ending because, but you know, I think the thing that's interesting about Larry was that he, he suffered from this, again, this concept of the law of unintended consequences. That we start out with certain expectations, but then something else happens. You know, someone once said life itself is what happens to you when you're busy doing something else. When you, and, and I think that marriage is, is probably one of the greatest examples we have of this problem because we begin going into marriage with a certain set of expectations. The expectation is that he's going to love me unconditionally. That's what the women are hoping for. The men are expecting she's going to always respect me the way she respects me now. But somewhere along in the journey, that begins to change. There's a, actually, it's, 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 it's been scientifically uh, uh, identified and, and analyzed that infatuation is something that chemically affects us for a period of about two to four years. That if there weren't for this, this idea that we view each other with a certain set of rose-colored glasses, we probably would never marry. If my wife had known me as I really was, I'm guaranteed she never would have married me. She assumed all sorts of things about me that too soon proved to not be completely true. So that there were a couple of things about me that she discerned accurately, but most of the stuff was all a surprise. She early on became a, a believer in alien abductions. <laughs> She was convinced that the guy that she married had been taken away by aliens and this clone had been stuck in its place because the guy that she married was tender and sensitive and, and you know, uh, just very cool and calm and collected and rational, witty, intelligent, capable. And instead, she found herself with this guy who was, had a short fuse, uh, tended to be very morose, was very reactive, seemed to blow his cool at the simplest of things in life, but most importantly, wasn't a tender, gentle, caring, sensitive guy. He was just really more interested in making sure that his own personal needs were met. 
I was on a flight uh, one time, and, and I happened to be sitting next to a guy who was a scientist with the Center for Disease Control, and his job was to make sure that you can't smoke in a restaurant. That's basically, he, he described his job. That's, that's what he's working on, legislation to make it, make it so that, you know, you can't smoke in public places. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't, that wasn't really a big issue for me because, you know, I, I always smoke in secret so nobody knows about it anyway. But, uh, but the point is that... <laughs> But the point is that, that uh, you know, I started asking him all these questions, and I always like to start by asking so he's got a chance to ask me what I do, because if they ask me first what I do, the conversation ends right there. You know, he starts wanting to find the sports page inside the Wall Street Journal. And so I started asking him all these questions, and he was telling me about all the things that he was doing, and then he said finally, so what do you do? And I thought, well, if I tell him a pastor, that not, might not take us anywhere. So I said, well, basically I'm actually returning from, from doing a conference on marriage uh, on the East Coast. I, I speak a lot. I've written a book on, on marriage and so forth. And he goes, oh, so you're an expert on marriage. I said, no, 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 no. I'm not an expert. I'm a survivor. And I think that's the only honest answer that we can ultimately get, you know, because uh, it, it reminds me of one well-known Christian author who, who, uh, uh, had a had a uh, a little track that he published once. He called it Black Sunday, and in it he talked about one Sunday morning when he and his wife and the kids were going to church, and how they got into arguments and fights, and all this stuff was going on, and how terrible it was, and all that they learned from that experience. And as I'm reading about this one Sunday, I'm saying to my wife, "This is every Sunday at our house," you know. And the idea somehow that yeah, we had this experience just so we could know what to tell you, to help you people. The truth of the matter is I would have loved it much more saying, let me tell you what our life is really like. And that's one of the things that we have to deal with. I mean, if we're ever going to make any progress is we really get kind of honest, you know, as someone once said, getting down and brown, which actually the root of that saying is not very attractive to think about. It has something to do with stripes and underwear. But anyway, but the bottom line is, there are stripes on the underwear. Anyway, that was another thing my wife was shocked by. But the bottom line was that, that you begin to realize that there's a certain common reality and common experience that we don't feel comfortable talking about, particularly within the Christian context, because we have this horrible layered pressure to come across as if, you know, now that we've found God, we, we've got it all worked out. But where I want to start with is, is really with a, an issue that I think that some of you I know have gone through. Some of you have gone through it numerous times. Or more importantly, some of you are on the cusp of going there. I find it's very, very common when I do these seminars that there are husbands and wives that come to these and basically the divorce papers were left on the, on the counter at home and one of them is saying to the other, okay, I'll go to this, but if this doesn't help, I, I'm filing. I am done. I can't do this anymore. And so I want to begin by, by, by looking at this whole issue of, of divorce because it's such an integral part of our life. You see, the United States leads the world in divorce. We have the highest percentage of it. And some of the divorce statistics we hear are a bit distorted because we often hear that half of marriages end in divorce. That's actually not correct at all. 27% of marriages end in divorce. And of course, because we're Christians, we do much better so that only 26% of Christian marriages end in divorce. So we've got a much better record there, okay? But the point is this, that, that there are about, about one out of four Americans will, will experience divorce in their life. And of those one in four, many of them will experience it on multiple occasions. Because they fall into the same trap. They think if I marry somebody different, then somehow I'll get a different result. So someone wants to find insanity as doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result each time. And, and part of the problem is, is that the reason why these people have multiple marriages and multiple divorces is because they have the same person involved in every one of those marriages themselves. They're carrying themselves, they're carrying their issues. And I found an uncanny thing in counseling with many of these couples. There's an amazing capacity to kind of pick the exact same person that they were in the previous marriage with and not recognizing it. So one of the things I think that we, we need to realize is that even though every 2.7 seconds somebody in America is getting a divorce, there's something that we have to come to grips with, and that is it's not necessary. 
It's not necessary. The idea of somehow, we'll talk about some of the myths that underlie divorce in our marriage. The reason I start here isn't because I want to start off on a negative, but rather I start here because until this issue is taken off the table, your marriage will never be able to heal. As long as that's an option, as long as that the D word is allowed to come up in conversation, then you're imperiling your relationship. I remember when my wife and I, we'd been married less than a year, and the D word came up. And when we uttered it, it was kind of frightening because suddenly uh, it, it, it gave animation and life to something that we had sworn we would never do. And I'll be honest, the only reason my wife... Uh, and I didn't get divorced is because I am so incredibly charming. <laughs> That's the truth of it. I mean, she just couldn't bear living without me. Well, that's my reality. Uh, no, the truth of the matter was that we came to a conclusion because we said, first of all, the Bible says you can't do it. I mean, that's long and short of it. God said the only way you can do it is for reasons that we weren't interested in going to. So therefore, we said we're stuck, really. I mean, I hate to put it in such negative terms, but that was kind of like, well, I guess we made our bed and now we have to sleep in it, except you can't sleep in mine anymore. But, you know, we were stuck in this, this relational dynamic that we didn't feel we could get out of. Secondarily, we found that how would, we, how would our testimony uh, come across to our family members? I mean, we'd been sharing with, with them about how Jesus had changed our life and freed us from sin, and we were born again, we're going to heaven, being used by God, la di la di la di la di But the problem is, is now, if we get a divorce, we completely wipe out our entire testimony. Because uh, one of the quotes, statements I put in my book is that if the difference that Jesus makes doesn't make a difference, what difference does it make? And that's what the non-Christian world is struggling with when we, they see us walking around. When our divorce rate is exactly the same as ours, and they're saying, why do you pretend like you have something to tell me? It's not working for you. Why are you acting as if it will work for us? And so part of what we have to understand is that God's desire is that our relationships have the kind of uh, character of them, that this kind of loving, respectful relationship for one another that makes the world say, I wish I had what you had. I wish I possessed what you and I, you possess. Now, my wife and I are, are, are doing pretty good. I mean, we, you know, this last June we celebrated our 39th wedding anniversary. Next June will be number 40. We have four kids. Uh, some of them even talk to us. We have nine grandkids. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, like the, the lady at the car rental said, well, you don't look like that you're that old. And I, because I gave him my age, and I said, you should see my x-rays. <laughs> it's, it's pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's just, uh, but the simple fact is that, that we have survived for a long time, but not because there's something peculiar or unique or different about us. In fact, we are so much like you, uh, it even frightens us sometimes. And so I don't want to begin to address any of these things from the perspective of people that, you know, we don't really deal with these things or we don't know what you're going through. Man, we know it. We know it. And I, re I remember the three occasions my wife had, and I had an argument this morning. Uh, <laughs> you know, the reality is that this is, this is kind of where we live, that we're still working on the relationship. Because no marriage stays static. The world around you changes, you change, the dynamics of your relationship change, and if you don't learn how to grow together through these things, you're not going to survive. If you want everything to just stay the way they were when you first got married, well, good luck. Good luck. Because nothing stays the same, and so there has to be this constant situational reconnection that goes on throughout all the years of your married life together. It's very different than what you've been thinking about. But the bottom line is that, that suddenly these, there's these intruders, these interlopers that come into your family called children. And the, the first shock of realization that men didn't count on was that he is no longer the center of her, her universe. Uh, that, you know, somebody once said the only emotion that a mother with preschooler has is fatigue. 
And so, you know, you, you come home and you're used to being, having dinner prepared and, you know, you know, wine on the table and candlelights glowing and you're going to walk into this romantic moment yet again tonight. And instead you see this woman who hasn't even brushed her hair, still in her bathrobe. She opens the door and she goes, it's your turn. <laughs> and passes off the bundle of joy for you to clean and care for as she collapses in exhaustion someplace or maybe just simply falls asleep as she's stirring your oatmeal for dinner. <laughs> And it's right away you begin to say, what went wrong? What happened? Why aren't you romantic? And, and, and most of you have probably have been married long enough that you, you, you know these dynamics. And yet we, we go into these relationships with such a, a twisted sense of what we should have. We, we've seen the romantic movies. And you never notice how that in these romantic movies, they never follow, you through, follow these people through the rest of their life that we, we have this snapshot, you know, they go from, from the serendipitous encounter to the growing relationship, then the unexpected crisis, followed by a whole set of uh, unrealistic events that suddenly bring them back together. And, and you know, it's kind of like the movie, my wife and I love this movie, How to Lose a Man in Ten Days. You ever see that movie? It's just worth the price of admission. I mean, I just, we sit and laugh at each other because think, my goodness, there's so much of us in this. But as you, you watch this, and then in the end, there's this wonderful coming together, and, and the assumption is that they live happily ever after. But the movie ends. And the truth of the matter is that if, if you look at Hollywood and you look at the divorce rate, and uh, it's, it's staggeringly higher. You know, the, the self-destructive behavior patterns are so much higher in, in the celebrity world. They die so much younger than the rest of us. They suffer so many calamities, drug addiction, alcoholism, uh, you know, the rest. Uh, their, their lives are a complete train wreck that why we would ever look at what they do on the screen and think it has any relevance to our lives is really amazing. Because the truth of the matter is that if you were to follow them over the next two weeks or the next two years, you'd find that they begin to have the same kind of struggles and difficulties you have. They are no more prepared to deal with the realities of married life than anybody else is. And maybe less prepared. Because, you see, they're operating under these assumptions that you fall in love and that's all it takes. Well, one of the things that we don't consider is what is the impact upon us and our children when we do get a divorce. Uh, it's interesting, one study found that they said conflicts and loyalty to parents, these are consequences of the kids, that they have conflicts and loyalty to their parents, they have feelings of abandonment and insecurity. Now some of you came from homes where your parents were divorced so you know exactly what these things are. Those feelings of abandonment, insecurity, anxiety, depression, Difficulty concentrating on their studies. Usually academic scores go downhill very quickly. Sleep disturbances. Increased dependency on roommates and friends. In other words, they begin to build surrogate relationships with people in their peer group because they don't feel that they have that kind of relationship with their own parents. Financial difficulties. Difficulties with intimate relationships. In other words, there's a fear of trusting other people because they were so betrayed. Uh, eating disturbances, problems with sexual identity, the, the rapid growth of homosexuality is rooted to the breakdown of the family, not to any kind of fantasy form of genetic predisposition that we're told about. It has everything to do with the fact that they have been betrayed within family relationships through divorce. They withdraw from friends they, uh, and roommates and increased drug and alcohol use. All of that is kind of sterile and statistical, but let me read you a testimony that was written by one of my elders based upon his own life experience. Uh, he, he says the following, he says, Today in this room I would imagine that there are very few people who can say their lives haven't been changed in some way by divorce, whether it's been their own divorce, their parents, their brother or sister, or a close friend. Divorce is everywhere, and we can't help but be devastated in one way or another by the event. In my own life, I've seen it happen to my older sister, my best friend, people I work with. But the divorce that hurt me the most was that of my parents. You see, my parents always seemed to have the ideal marriage. They loved and supported each other in their careers. They never fought in front of us kids and were always affectionate to each other. But one night when I was 18, as I lay in bed reading, all of that changed, and I wondered if I really knew my parents at all. My father, who had been in Greenland for a year with the Air Force, had just come home, and we were looking forward to having things return to normal. 
But that night, I just could barely hear my parents having a discussion in their room, and I wasn't even paying attention until I heard the word divorce. And it made my heart stop. Surely they were talking about someone else, but as I listened closely, I realized that they were actually talking about it as a possible option for them. I couldn't believe it. They had always said their marriage was forever, that they would never even consider divorce. And I'm not sure that when the word divorce was mentioned that night, they were really serious about it. But once it was spoken, things went downhill fast. They began to fight openly, loudly, and often. The, the two people I loved the most in the world, the people whose love for each other had been the anchor in my life, began to hate each other. It tore us apart to hear them say hurtful things to each other and know they couldn't stand to be in the same room together. I began to wish that they would get a divorce so the fighting would stop. Yet two late years later, when they did divorce, I was devastated. I felt as though my parents had died. My family had died. I was 20 years old, and yet there was a little boy in me crying out, this isn't fair, this isn't fair. I can remember thinking, now wait a minute, you said you would love each other forever, and now you're quitting. Weren't you the ones who told me never quit? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Yeah, right out the door. You just invalidated a whole set of values and morals that you'd given me. And if you invalidated those, I'm not sure everything else you've taught me isn't also a bunch of garbage. Now you may say, come on, you're being a little melodramatic about all of this. But you have to realize I had looked at these two people as my role model for 20 years. They were my set of standards I was planning to use, and now those standards were blown to pieces. I literally had to go back to areas of my life. I quit school. I began drinking heavily and did a lot of very serious and self-destructive things. It took me a lot of years before I would take any advice from my parents on anything. Shortly after their divorce, my older sister, who was married and had two boys, separated and finally divorced her husband. For years, my youngest sister wavered back and forth in her loyalty towards my parents. She thought she had to choose sides. My middle sister recently married and never even told my father. My younger brother was hit the hardest. His young adult years were filled with one tragedy after another. And instead of being supported and encouraged by the strength of my parents' love for each other, he saw the two people awkwardly call a truce just so they could be there at the same time with him. And because my father lives in Texas and my mother lives in Germany, we can't afford to visit them both, so we visit neither. My kids know who my parents are, but don't know them. My five-year-old doesn't understand why Grandpa is married to a lady who is not my mom. And the list of lives that have been affected by divorce goes on and on, and that is why the Bible says, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Now let me give you a little more detail about Dan so you'll know, understand how dramatic this was. You see, when his parents divorced, he was, he, was a, a, he was a cadet at the Air Force Academy. He had, you know, a pretty uh, exciting career in front of him. He's very bright, very brilliant. But, but, you know, when you're in the Air Force Academy, you can't quit because you are enlisted in the military. So what he did was he flunked out. He purposely flunked out so they eventually would throw him out of school and for the next 10 to 15 years, he worked at a low-paying job. And I would often wonder, why are you working there doing this when you're one of the brightest guys I know? You're so capable. He had no motivation, no energy to do anything until finally God brought him to such a place of healing in his life that he began to change and make some decisions. And now he's become an extremely successful businessman. He's actually a co-host for my radio show as well. But it's, it's amazing to see how the devastating impact that this had upon his life. And we have to understand that, that children are the, the greatest recipients of the harm of divorce. Because, uh, you know, years, it's interesting because we find that there are all sorts of myths that are out there in, in our society about divorce that, that we need to explode. Because I've heard them repeated to me so many times by couples who are in that process. And so I decided, you know, we just need to really begin by just pulling the rug out from these lies. Because you know what a myth is. It's, it's something that's a, a fanciful story that has no basis in fact, and yet some people believe it to be true. It's like the cover of the uh, National Enquirer, which was uh, you know, one of my favorite reads. 
my wife and I are going through the, the checkout stand at the grocery store, and I see this, this National Enquirer cover, and I just had to purchase it. You know, and it's kind of embarrassing because I don't want to pretend that I, I'm a regular subscriber to this, but at the same time, you know, I just, I just had to buy it, and so I did. And what it was, it was a picture on the, on the cover, it was a picture of a mummy, and the story was about a janitor at, at the Cairo Museum in Egypt who fell in love with this mummy, and, and the title was Mummy Dearest. And it went on to this whole thing about how they've been carrying on this relationship. And, and the very difficult thing was that it, it, because of the intimacy of the relationship, the mummy now was pregnant and about to bear a child. I mean, I'm just reading this story, and it's just absolutely so insanely stupid. Because one of the things, if you know anything about the Egyptian mummies, is they take everything out, you know? I mean, it's take, overlook the fact she's been dead for 3,000 years. <laughs> uh, you know, in fact, the, Joan Collins looks like she's been dead for 3,000 years. But the point is, uh, the fact that they, they, they're wrapped in bundles and all the rest of this, you know, they're dried harder than jerky. Uh, and all, but all the internal organs were all taken out and put in canopic jars. You know, I mean, it's just so insanely crazy. And yet here was this story, and they were going on, and the guy just couldn't, couldn't. Uh, he felt bad, but he couldn't help that she kept on calling out to him from her box, I guess. <laughs> and I'm looking at this and going, I, you know, I asked people, how many of you think this is a true story? Well, nobody raised their hand, mainly because I mocked it beforehand, but I'm sure there were some people who thought maybe it could be true. Love is a powerful thing. I saw Princess Bride. I, I saw Princess Bride, Bride and he said a true love is the, is the uh, most powerful thing in the world. So even if you're you know, dead, you may be only mostly dead. I mean, and, and you can be brought back. But the whole point is we understand what a myth is, but you, most people don't realize there's things that we have believed, we've been told even by professionals about marriage and divorce that have been found to be so false so completely false that they could be categorized as a lie if they had been actually perpetrated by somebody like Hitler or Goebbels. But rather they were perpetrated by what we might call well-intentioned dragons. You know, the idea of a well-intentioned dragon, it doesn't matter how good his intentions are, if he breathes on you, he's going to toast you and fry you and kill you. So that it, it may be meant for good reasons, but basically it was based upon a falsehood. Now, one of the most common things is that falsehoods are myths is that happy marriages are the result of marrying the right person. Um, it's interesting because, as I mentioned before, every marriage goes through a series of changes and seasons, so the right person at one moment may not be the right person at the next moment in your life. For example, Jane Aldous, in her uh, kind of groundbreaking work, Family Careers and Development Changes in the Families, had what she called the marriage satisfaction chart. And one thing she said, the emotional euphoria which most marriages start is eroded over time by establishing daily routines, by growing irritation from constant association, by competing attractions of jobs and children, and by coping with the multitudinous problems both large and small. What she did is she took couples who had been married over a period of 20 years and she basically scored them on a level of how, uh, their highest points of satisfaction and their lowest points of satisfaction. Not surprising, the highest point of satisfaction in marriage for the couple was within the first few years of marriage. That's when they enjoyed being married the most because they're really kind of in an extended and intensive dating relationship up to this point. But then the thing, one factor that changes is when children enter into the home. Now, if you have children, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but you think there's something wrong with you because you thought that, especially the ladies thought, when we bring a child, this will just make us that much more in love with each other. But the, the pressures and the stresses of time, money, and energy, when you realize that this baby is going to cost you at a minimum $187,000 to raise to adulthood. It almost sounds like some kind of government finance program. You know, you just know that this is, and, and that's a conservative number. You know it's just going to continue to grow as time goes on. But it's the time pressures and the change of relationships. You know, I don't need to tell you guys about this, but, you know, it's just like you can't do anything easily anymore. My, when we were flying over to Maui uh, on Monday and spending some time there, and my son and, and his, his wife are coming over with their, their, their one-year-old baby. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting because when we flew over, we had to actually pay extra freight because we're carrying both uh, the playpen and the booster seat. 
because they don't have enough space, you know, and they don't have any money. So we're paying to bring this over with us. And I think, you know, when I travel, I had to actually go out and buy a large suitcase to accommodate all this extra stuff. You see, I'm a seasoned traveler. I mean, I, I roll aboard and I roll out. I don't care how long I'm going or where I'm going in the world. If I can't carry it on the plane, I, I don't want to carry it with me because I found there's an inverse relationship between the amount of luggage you have and how much fun you have on the trip. The more luggage, the less fun. And, and so here suddenly I'm, I'm pulling all this stuff with me through airports. Why? Because they have a baby. That's why they have a baby. And everything changes. And we're thinking about, well, okay, we're thinking about all these nice restaurants we want to take them so they can have a good time. But we're thinking we probably have to send them and pay for them to go. And we'll stay and watch the baby so they can actually have some time alone. I mean, you guys understand. These dynamics, it changes everything. Well, you have to understand that just those dynamics alone will not guarantee that you're happy unless you're wealthy enough to hire a nanny. And then your biggest struggle is the fact that a child likes the nanny better than you. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, this is, uh, you know, I know nannies who are celebrity nannies, are friends of ours. I mean, our kids are friends with, and one of the issues is that the kids started bonding with the nanny. And then these celebrities get jealous because, but they don't want to be parents all the time, so I don't, I don't know what the answer is. But you see, the problem is that, that these, these kind of dynamics happen all the time. And it's not about marrying the right person. It's learning how to be the right person. It's learning how to be the right person. And this is where I think the first step of change can take place, is when I stop focusing upon my spouse, which is convenient and often comfortable, because I would much more prefer about how screwed up your marriage is than to have to talk about mine. But the simple fact is that until I began to say, okay, God, what do I need to change? Because here's one of the big discoveries in my life. There's only one person in the world that you can change. It's you. You see, most women, you know, most men marry hoping their wives will never change. They want her to be 20 and trim the rest of their life. That's what they hope for. And, and most women hope that he will change, you know, and neither one get what they want. He doesn't change, and she does. I mean, neither one of them get what they want. And so, you know, you just, you just realize that, that the likelihood just isn't there that you would ever be able to accomplish this goal. So what do you do? Who can I change? I can't change my wife. I can't make her a different person. I have to deal with me. And yet, when we have arguments, how, does the, how do those flow? Where the wife usually starts with a wife expressing something like, well, I just don't think you love me. I don't love you. What do you mean I don't love you? Look at that couch. You know how much I paid for that couch? You know, and, and, and she goes, that's the problem with you. You just think it's about things. And you know what? I care about my feelings. And he, you know, he says, I care about your feelings. I just wish you'd stop having them. That's how much I care about them. And you start having this wonderful relationship. And you go away saying, God, you just got to do something, do something with her. I remember how my wife and I, I remember one very, very difficult season when we were living in Denver, Colorado. We were living in a Christian commune. We had one, one room that we lived in, and it had black and white psychedelic wallpaper. So that when you looked at the walls, it was like snakes were crawling all around you. And, 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 uh, and the trim, it was black and deep purple trim. And all the, I mean, it, would been, it had been a hippie drug house before we moved into it. And uh, I still think there probably was a lot of demons living there. But the whole thing is, we're in this horrible, confined little situation, living together, trying to serve God, ministering to the people in the inner city. And we're having fights like you can't believe. And I remember on, on one occasion, I just finally said, God, I don't need to remind you what your word says about wives submitting to their husbands. <laughs> you know, and, and I know that you know, and, 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 and I just... You know, don't make me take her to Genesis 3. God, I just ask it, that you would just change this woman and, and just rebuke her. I don't know. Don't kill her. Just bring her really close. You know? Put the fear of God in her, Lord, and just change. I'm really, you know, just praying this. Have you ever prayed and, and realized that God isn't listening? <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, the prophet said, the skies are brass or iron over your head. You can feel the prayers coming back faster than they go up. And so I began to kind of fish around for, you know, what it was going to be the key to unlock the door, to get heavens to begin to do what I wanted them to do. As C.S. Lewis once said, prayer does not change God, it changes us. Well, I didn't know that yet. I thought I could manipulate God through my praying. 
And finally, when I didn't know what else to pray, I said, and Lord, if perchance, I mean, how small a chance is going to be, but if perchance there's something in me that you need to change, I'm just, I'm just open to that. And suddenly we had, we had contact. Suddenly we had communication. And suddenly God just began to impact me. And all I could see was that it was all about me. I was, my feelings were hurt and I was angry. And I, hadn't, didn't, I wasn't thinking at all about what she was going through or what was taking place in their life. It just became all about me. And I found myself really humbled and broken, and I, and I felt God urging me to go back to her and say, would you forgive me? You know, and that was the first step in us beginning to realize that it's not about marrying the right person, it's about being the right person. And it's one of those wonderful things is that, that um, you find, as, as Proverbs 19 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. That God gave me my wife because he knew that she would grind me in places where I needed grinding. And it's funny, you know, we say opposites attract. Actually, we're attracted to people who we think will be great compensators for who we are or who we aren't. In other words, my wife looked at me and, and, and she's kind of this very linear, singular relational kind of person who loves to live in a very ordered and structured world. And she sees me as, I mean, this probably surprised you, but I'm kind of gregarious, kind of, uh, I'm comfortable in just about every setting in the planet. I can live anywhere or talk to anybody, hang out with anybody and, and be okay with that. I'm not as extreme as Gail Irwin, who is so comfortable with everything that he doesn't even know who he is anymore. But, <laughs> but you know, but still, you know, I mean, it's just... I don't get, you know, meeting new people and all sorts of stuff is just kind of, kind of interesting to me, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, we had an experience since we met on the island. Just had a very interesting conversation, and my wife was very uncomfortable, and I was very kind of like, wow, that's, that's guys, guys gone over the edge. But um, you just have these kind of experiences in your life that, you know, th this difference of way you relate to things. Well, she was so attracted to that, that kind of confidence that I had. I was attracted to the fact that she actually had a plan. So that when we would get in a car together and I'd say, let's just go for a drive, uh, she would say, where are we going? I said, uh, that way. <laughs> what do you mean, that way? I said, well, let's just drive and see what, what, and she said, well, you can't just go. You've got to have some kind of plan. I mean, do you have enough gas to get where it is you're going? I said, if I knew where I was going, I could answer the question. But since I don't have a really plan as to where we're actually going, I don't know if I have enough gas. But hey, that's part of the adventure as well. And suddenly she's just going, you're driving me crazy. I need a plan. And I said, plans drive me crazy. And so the very thing that attracted us now became the thing that repelled us. And I began to find out that, you know, my mother, bless her heart, she loved me so much that, you know, I, I never made my bed. I never cleaned my room. I never put anything back. It just magically found its way. I'd come home every, more, every afternoon and everything was made and put in place. Oh, this, is a, this is a cool deal. Isn't this what moms live for? Isn't this their, their joy, their hope, their dream to, to care for their young boys and to, to just take care of them? And, and so then I married this woman who came from an extremely dysfunctional family <laughs> where the children were expected to put things away. The children were expected to be responsible for their own things. And I thought, what kind of a sick home has this woman been <laughs> subjected to? You know, uh, I have needs here. Hello? The remote, not on your life. Honey, I've got good news. i got tickets to the football game. You know? It was, it was, suddenly we found ourselves coming from these very, very different dramatic areas. And it's interesting because, you know, now that we're kind of custodial parents with our parents, and, and a after 40 years, I'm, I'm around my mother a lot after a 40-year vacancy, and I suddenly realize, whoa, <laughs> interesting person, not who I thought. And it's kind of like, <laughs> you know, you just begin to realize that, you think that your background and your childhood and your raising is so normal. I realize that my parents' family was extremely dysfunctional. My parents didn't talk. They didn't take vacation together. They had separate careers. They lived in separate parts of the house. We only came together for birthdays and holidays, and then they went their different ways. And it was kind of the, they both decided it's probably cheaper to keep her. Keep her. And so they just stayed together, but uh, they had no relationship. 
The only thing they had was my brother and I. That was it. And I realized that this had had a tremendously malforming concept that I, I didn't connect. We were married a week, and I went on a business trip for a week. And she was upset because I wouldn't take her. And I said, well, you know, you, you just be in the way. <laughs> just being honest. <laughs> and, 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 and wondering why that upset her. She had this idea of being together. I said, you know, after we have sex, just don't touch me. I'm not used to sleeping with other people. <laughs> yeah, I was, a, I, was a, I was a gem, I tell you. The, the poor women who didn't get me as a husband, I feel <laughs> still sorry for them. There's a second myth that we have, and that's the idea that if we shack up before marriage, that helps us to prepare for marriage. Truth of the matter is, people who live together before marriage have, have twice as likely a chance of not surviving even if they do get married. In other words, couples who live together before they get married have a 50% higher divorce rate than the general population. And, and it's probably not, not that surprising, really, because you have to, you basically uh, most of them, half of the, take the couples, let me try to break this down so you can comprehend it, half of couples who move in together will never get married. 50%. So, you know, when gals, the guy says, well, let's move together and see if it works out because I never buy a car without test driving it. And so, basically, I want to make sure that this is going to work. And it's interesting. Studies have found that 90% of the motivation or the move to live together comes from men, not from women. Women want to get married, and so they're willing to move in with a guy to let him test drive the convertible until he realizes what a wonderful deal she is, and then they get married. But in half the cases, marriage never happens. And of the couples who do get married, only half of them stay married. They end up getting divorced. And, and the reason is because he doesn't want to make a commitment. Or as Laura Schlesinger put it so poetically, why buy the milk when you can get it for free? You see, the, the point is, when a man says, let's just live together before marriage, what he's really saying is, I, I want all the benefits of married life. I just don't want the responsibility. But what happens, therefore, is the woman is on this high-end serving dynamic where she's really trying to sell the product. She's really trying to convince him that she's worthwhile, and she's going to do everything to, to reinforce and make herself attractive to him. And he's sitting there saying, this is cool. I'm getting all this goodies, and I don't have to pay for them. You know, all of us like free. But what happens when there's suddenly a price attached to it? You have to commit. You have to be responsible. Suddenly I have to commit to the rest of my life to being with you. Well, that's where the guy's saying, I don't know what happened. I've just fallen out of love. Well, again, if you look at the, the chemical uh, effect of infatuation, it's actually the catalyzing of a hormone that kind of causes one actually to have a distorted view of reality. But after two to four years, that actually wears off and you start seeing each other without the blinders, without the rose-colored glasses. If you don't have the commitment to marriage, then you're not going to stay married. And I love the line. The guys say, I, hey, marriage is only a piece of paper. And he said, you're absolutely right. In fact, would you bring me the title of your car and the title of your house? Because it's just a piece of paper. No, it, it's only a piece of paper if you don't value it. And the man who says, and you can, guys, you can keep this in mind for your daughters, the guy who says it's just a paper, piece of paper says that because to him that's all it is. It's just a piece of paper. He doesn't value you. He doesn't value the commitment. A third myth that's out there, it's better to divorce than to, get, than to fight. What's amazing about this is I remember in the 50s and 60s and 70s hearing this promoted by psychiatrists, counselors, psychologists. It's, it's traumatic for the kids to watch the fighting. And even as Dan relates in his story, he says, I got to the point where I wish they would divorce just so the fighting would stop. But that's the problem. Are those the only choices you have? The simple fact is what we find is that even in homes where the parents fight, it's healthier for the kids if the parents stay together. Because when there's a divorce, there's this unnatural breaking of the relationship that forever scars the life of the child. The older the child is, even unto adulthood, I've talked with 30 and 40 year old men whose parents got a divorce and they're completely devastated because they feel like everything, as Dan said, that I believed on has suddenly been removed and I don't believe anything's true anymore. So the point is that it wasn't until the 1980s when the Family Resource Council, Research Council actually did a 
a, a, a scientific study of the effect of divorce on children. And surprise, surprise, what they discovered was that it's better even in a bad marriage for parents to stay together because the emotional impact of divorce is so devastating to kids. And it's, it's, fine, it's interesting because uh, basically we find that once you divorce, you put into play divorce as a live option. And I think part of the dynamic, my wife's parents, my wife had, and her parents had never been divorced. And, and my parents, uh, actually my mom had been divorced. I didn't realize that. My dad was a widower. But at the time, all I knew was my parents, and they stayed together until my dad passed away. And um, some people, you know, wonder why did he, he die when he did. And I think it was because he wanted to. Um, but the, the thing that's really interesting about that relationship was that it did present with us divorce as an option. We had no family experience. We had no, no relatives who had ever divorced. We would be going into virgin territory. And there's something about that, going into the areas that just is kind of unexpected, unanticipated. And so for us right away, it was like, it's not like we'd grown up, as I see with so many kids we talk to today that their parents were divorced and their parents were divorced and so they get married with this thing in the back of their head saying, well, you know, we'll probably get divorced too. And I'll never forget when, when uh, one of our granddaughters came up to her, would you and grandma ever get a divorce? I said, no. I mean, it just kind of shocked me. She says, oh, okay, I just wanted to know. Because in her world, she's seen divorce aplenty. All of their friends are divorced. I mean, the, the neighborhoods are filled with divorced families. And as a consequence, you know, this idea of divorce being an option is so live in so many people's lives. And yet what we have to understand is that we often, again, as uh, in fact, uh, one of the landmark studies by Judy Wallerstein at, at the University of California, Berkeley, she did what was called, it's entitled The Unexpected Legacy of Divorce, a 25-year landmark study. One of the things she said is, our findings challenge the myth that divorce is a transient event or crisis. Now we see that the major hurt is in adulthood when internalized images of mother, father, and their relationship come to center stage and shape the choices their grown children make. Divorce predisposes children to divorce. And the more the divorce is, the more common it becomes, the more normal it becomes, the more we find people are willing to give themselves up to a divorce. And you know what's sad? It's like the miner who was working out in the Arizona desert looking for gold, and he dug and he dug and he dug and he dug and he dug, and finally just out of disgust, and he just went back to town, sold his claim, and, uh, and, and, and took what little money he had and moved out to California and forgot about it. The guy who bought it went out and began digging in the same claim and within a week struck a major vein and became an extremely wealthy man. And it's kind of one of those classic stories, you quit too soon. Here's the thing, God promises that if you stick it out, he'll bless your relationship. And I remember as I was seeking the Lord in those early days of our marriage, which was so very, very painful, and God just simply told me, if you're faithful, I will bless this union. If you're faithful to me, I will bless. One day, this relationship will be a relationship of great joy and blessing to your life. And I clung to that. I thought, God, okay, because I had never felt anything so painful as the problems we were having in our relationship. You know what I'm talking about. There's nothing that hurts worse than loving someone who doesn't like you or liking someone who doesn't love you. That's two sides of the equation. That's one of the things we'll get into later on today is that as, as men and women are sitting here listening to me talk, the men are hearing something completely different than what the women are hearing and vice versa. There's nothing on the planet that you do that's exactly the same. The more we understand that, the better we become at communicating with each other because you realize we speak foreign languages. We speak foreign languages. We do not look at anything. The way information goes into your brain as a man is completely different and how it's processed is even more completely different than it is for a woman and vice versa. But I don't want to steal all my thunder and get it all out in the first message. But the whole point is that you have to understand this idea that it's better to divorce than to fight has been proven scientifically to be an absolute falsehood. There's no truth in it at all. The fourth myth that we find is, and this is one that just fries me the most, when somebody will come in my office, and it's usually a woman who says, I know the Bible says it's wrong to divorce, but God will forgive me. You know, I, I don't question that God will forgive you. He will forgive you. But sin has its consequences. 
That's why he says in Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. You see, uh, the Bible's very clear. Divorce is a sin. Of course, there's a few small minor categories in which God says it's allowable. God never counsels us to sin. He never advises us to sin. I have people come into my office and say, Pastor, uh, would you counsel me to divorce my spouse because they committed adultery? And I said, no. I'll tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says you can divorce your spouse if they commit adultery. But I never counsel anybody to divorce. And I would encourage you to spend time before the Lord and ask God if that's the only option you have. Because maybe God wants to heal and restore your marriage and make it better than you've ever thought. You see, we, 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 we should never advise anybody to get divorced. Even I, and I tell this to audiences oftentimes because I find that a lot of times we become the well-intentioned dragon. We have a friend or a family member who's going through a difficult time. He's saying, well, if I were you, I would just divorce them. That is the most unkind thing you could possibly say. Because what you're doing is you're saying, give up because it's difficult. Instead, you should say, let's pray that somehow God could save this relationship. Somehow it can be fixed. You know, it's kind of like being in the middle of a sea and having a ship that has a leak in it and deciding that, you know, it's so much work to repair it that we're just going to let it sink. And so everybody climbs in the lifeboats and the ship sinks and then they're sitting in the lifeboats without water and with food and saying, somehow this didn't seem like such a big deal. Now suddenly it seems like it would have been worthwhile trying to fix the leak because you're in such a worse situation afterwards. That's the way it is with divorce. Well, Will God forgive you? Yes, God forgives you, but it doesn't mean that there won't be consequences. You know, it, it's kind of like the <laughs> Alfred E. Newman thing I saw when I was a kid where he, Mad Magazine, the guy's sitting there with all these bumps on his head, he's got a hammer in his hand, and he says, I love to hit myself in the head with a hammer because it feels so good when I quit. And you think, you know, that's, that's really a, kind of the wrong way to look at any problem, isn't it? And yet, essentially, that's what you're doing when you say something like that. Saying, oh, well, I know it's wrong to, to cut my hand off, but stink. You know, that way I wouldn't have to buy two, pairs of, two pieces of glove. You know, or cut off one foot so I can just get away with one shoe. It's like, in fact, I was listening to the news. Of a, uh, a, the police came on the scene of a break-in. They found uh, somebody had gone into a store sh uh, shoe store, broken in, and stole a shoe. They just took one shoe and left the other one there. And so <laughs> it said it made their frenzy work much easier. They just looked for a one-legged man with a new shoe on. And sure enough, they found him hobbling down the road. But the whole point is it's, it doesn't make any sense to operate on that basis because God just says, you know, you have to understand that if you make this choice, yes, I will forgive you, but that doesn't mean there won't be consequences to it. You'll regret it. And I, I just, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who just said it was the wrong choice. I wish I had listened to counsel. Uh, the fifth myth, and the last one that, that I'll, I'll cover with you, is the idea that I have a right to be happy, don't I? I have a right to be happy. I love that question when I'm asked that by a counselee because I have a, a response that I, I actually find a perverse pleasure in giving to them. I just look at them right across my desk and say, absolutely not. I said, there's no place in the Bible you'll find where God says you have a right to be happy. In fact, here's one of the interesting things about life. Have you ever known anybody who's in pursuit of happiness that ever found it? Because Jesus said, here's the way the world works. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. The joy is found in the giving of ourself. In fact, there's kind of this oxymoronic dynamic of the Christian life. The first will be last. The greatest will be the least. The master will be the servant. It's all backwards, but God says, you know, until you understand that it's in the serving, in the giving, in the humbling of yourself, putting yourself last and the other person first, that's where you begin to find joy. As C.S. Lewis put it in, in one of his great books, he said, Surprised by Joy was the title of his book. And he found that in giving of himself to his wife, Joy, he discovered that what he did as a kindness to her came back and became the answer to the thing that had been the longing of his heart as a man all his life. He married her out of a convenience to help her emigrate to England. They were good friends, very platonic relationship, but he married her for, for, for her kindness to her so that her family would be safe and secure from an abusive husband and all these dynamics that were going on. But he said, you know, so they got married out of convenience, but then suddenly he found himself being strangely attracted to this woman that he had married. That friendship, this platonic relationship built upon their love, common love for literature, grew into this other thing and then when she finally was diagnosed with cancer, I mean, this became the greatest tragedy of his life. 
And her name was Joy, and that's why he said surprised by Joy. Joy brought joy in his life that he didn't anticipate that he would ever know. And when she was taken from him, ultimately, when she died of the cancer, that which he loved the most in this life was suddenly gone from him. And he realized the depth of the love.